you're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. Yes, you are listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast, Ruffy. That's the only one. Doing. It's the only one in the whole wide world that brings the Firehouse Kitchen Table to you. You might be hearing that more and more as you scroll through YouTube. Oh, look. It's the Firehouse Kitchen Table. I wonder where we got that from. Oh, wait. It's the Firehouse Kitchen Table. We're going to drill at the Firehouse Kitchen Table. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's what I said. But this is the only one. Self-proclaimed. Best podcast. Gonzo got a haircut. Looks, He looks all... He looks you get good. One? You, you got it for uh, Passover? Well, yeah, you know, I had I didn't the. Know you were uh, Jewish, bro. <laughs> I got to do both. You know how that goes. Uh, oh, Italian and double, Jews, same corporation. Have, have the Italians cater that, you know? <laughs> Next time. <laughs> What'd you have? Yeah. A little gavilta? Amazing. Well, um, <laughs> God, that shit was on the table. I was like, oh my God, it's for real. <laughs> That's all you kept thinking about was, was Maniscalco, right? You're like, I, oh I, my we, God. I brought it up in, uh, what, what's, times. what's the Passover feast consist of? Uh, well, there's brisket, you have uh, matzo ball oh. soup. Which isn't half bad. You right. uh, depending, you can put some other stuff. They go through the whole ceremony where they will put the uh, the wine out. They'll do the uh, dip the egg, and my wife's very good at that stuff. And I don't remember it. I just I follow her lead every time. But <clears throat> what's the difference between a matzo ball and a mozzarella? Well, one's cheese and one is corn, like a corn. Meal, yeah, it's it? a corn oh, it's meal. Not like even, they it's can't not have cheese? bread or stuff that rises. Oh, I thought matzo ball. I thought a matzo ball was like cheese. No, it's in soup. Oh, it's in soup. Oh, he says. Will you just taste the soup? Yeah. Taste the soup. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Do you wear a yarmulke on uh, Passover? Sometimes. Oh, I have... would pay, anybody out there has a picture of that. I will pay big bucks to get a the yarmulke. What is it like? Uh, Does it have your name on it? Is it embroidered? <laughs> well, is it the size wife, of a frisbee? A <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, will, I will upload one of those pictures so we can reference that. Because I, I did give Lou one of my big frisbee helmet stickers. Yeah. <laughs> But the yarmulke must look like a giant waffle on on your head, bro. It's something like a yeah, frisbee. You know, I, I have that. You uh, must really love that woman, huh? I do. Oh, <laughs> That's what it comes down to. There's only one way you can put prayer? that frisbee on your head is if you, you love do the prayer that before woman. That? Oh, that my shit. my wife and my kids. She's very good at it. I just I just listen. Did they pass out the literature? My, yeah, the, you know, reading material. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, didn't have any bread. Wow. I want to get wow. the bread. I want to start dunking. You know, right? Something to do with my right hand. <laughs> what is that? Velvet? What is, what is that? that? Velvet? Holy shit. Matzo ball soup. Oh my God. 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 Look, it's beautiful. What is that? Velvet? <laughs> oh, man. Too good. How was your Easter, Ruffy? Very nice. I was by my mother in law. I they had the big Ginzo thing, right? What did you have? The meatballs and the lasagna? What did you have? We did. We had lasagna. We had, uh, what did we have? Chicken cordon bleu. We really? had meatballs. Mm. We had a- pasta. Yeah, that pasta. Yeah, lasagna. Oh, the lasagna. Right, right, right. I made monogoth yeah. yesterday for. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yesterday. Stuffed mushrooms. Easter. We had stuffed was mushrooms. It, was it right? kosher? The uh, the it was, it was just for me. <laughs> oh, just. Actually, sorry, my wife. She cheated a little bit. She did eat some. Oh, oh my god! What kind of? Oh, she's right oh, now. Boy, she's, she's right now. Trouble. I can't believe I did. Is the chief in the back? Can you see him? Is he going like this right now? Like, nah, 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 right nah. Right he's, oh, he's just <laughs> good. He's doing big belly laughs. Who, yeah. Tony? <laughs> that's, that's Tony Saragusa. That's not Tom no, Saragusa. Um, I, I, I sent Gonzo the, the thumbnail, right? Tom, Sarah Gooser, the whole thing. And uh, there he is. So, so oh, this I, guy, right? When I posted this morning, I must have been like, I'm going through his whole thing, you know, where he worked, his whole thing, chief, where he worked. I'm like, oh, yeah, assistant chief, Tony Sarah Goose. It still says Tony Sarah Goose up there. It didn't change. I updated it. it just didn't so I, I did it too. All right. So it'll change after, but it was pretty funny. I'm like, so the best was he sent me like a little text, very nice. He just, he, he didn't want it, you know. <laughs> Get me, uh, you know, like make a mockery of me because I was an idiot. He's just like, you know, my name's fucking Tom. No, yeah. <laughs> he didn't say that. Yeah. Uh, no, I said it. He's nice. a good fella. It'll be a good show. We got to get one guy from California that, you know, got to get one good guy. From we got to hear. We got to hear it. This is the guy. Got we got to hit it right here. He's got a lot of fire stories. That's good. He does. I like that. You know that All right, West Coast, go. West Coast. He's a he's a guy. He's our West Coast connection. We're not going to bring him in yet because we got to we got to make a little money first. So, uh, Gans, do your thing, and I ain't touching nothing. My hands are away. Listen, we're going to first thing went sideways. Well. It's you. First thing worked already. So we're, we're, we're already um, sh- pointing fingers at you, Kobe. I'm not touching shit. So go ahead. All right. So we're going to uh, hear from our, fa- our friends over at the first responder. 
The First Responders Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding to the challenges to the health, safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders, too. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. This, this one is right up my alley. You ready? Do it. Wash your hands after returning from fire or EMS alarm before using the bathroom. Firefighters have a much higher risk of testicular cancer Ooh. than non-firefighters. Preventing direct contact with dirty hands is one way to minimize this risk. So don't take oh. the dirty hands and put oh, it on the junk. junk. <laughs> Keep it away from the junk. Keep All it right? away from the pisha you know? A it pisha away. Yeah, sorry. Keep it away. Unless, you want the, unless you want the ball cancer, you don't want the ball cancer. Okay. I'm not on that. They'll take one out. We'll be calling you uni ball. Don't you don't want to you don't, don't want to be a uni ball. No, it's no joke, man. Wash I know your guy. hands. I know a guy. All right, I know. A keep guy. going. Go. All right, here we go. Stand by. If you're looking for a gift for that special firefighter in your life, then head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. Yes, GettingSaltyApparel.com. What do we have? Well, we carry hand-drawn original t-shirts, glassware such as mugs, shot glasses, pint glasses, engraved Arctic cooler cups, and much, much more. There's also a full line of firefighter tool bottle openers like Halligan's, Nozzles, and wine bottle opener accesses too. And if you're a cigar smoker, congratulations! We have partner saw cigar cutters and humidors. Think we're done? Far from it. We got toiletry, gear bags, poozies, a full line of hats, decals, sweatshirts, and once again, so much more. We can also personalize most of these products. And if you want discounts, hey, you've come to the right place. We got discounts on large orders for promotion dinners, weddings, as well as installation dinners. Just head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. Nice. Think your balls are safe? Far from it. From it. Don't touch them with dirty <laughs> hands. <laughs> Oh, All right, and last but not least, guys, if you want to support us tonight, hit us up in the Super Chat. If you have that question that you need answered, please feel free to do so, but do so in the Super Chat, and we'll get that answered ASAP for you. Don't right. cry oh, oh, one more thing, Gons. Did you get the thing I sent you from uh, Friends of Firefighters? I have the... Uh, uh, you have the... Uh, the woo, I have this bad boy for you, but you want to give the description of what the... Uh, yeah, what so I is talked to what... Nancy today. I forgot to tell you this, Ruff. I talked to Nancy today, and... Since we've been doing these shows on mental health, they have been getting a ton of guys, which is great, coming forward, seeking help. But they're a little uh, inundated. They're a little uh, stretched short. out. They're short. Short. So, if, guys, if you really want to donate to a good cause, go to www.friendsoffirefighters.org. Give whatever you can, bro, because it's going directly to these guys and getting therapy for these guys. I, I have the uh, email. You said what percent they're up. It's a big, it's a dramatic increase. Really? Right? Yeah. Give me one like, second. I have it right here. Check it out. So it's uh, whatever you can give, fellas. Uh, so she says they conducted over 3,500 counseling sessions and accepted over 180 new clients. That represents a 59% wow. increase in sessions wow. and a 71% increase in clients compared to 2021. Uh, 2023 is teaching us that it, the need for these services is still growing. Since the start of this year, we've already accepted 82 new clients. Wow. That's a lot. So hopefully we got a hand in that and uh, more guys, we get more guys realizing that there's nothing to be ashamed of. But like I said, they're getting stretched in. So anything you guys can donate, do it. Come on, do it. Do it. Do it. Hit them up. Hit the J. Shoot the J. All right. All right. Now you can get into the Super Chat. Oh, I already did, did it. Super chat. Oh, all right, there we go. So let's bring, in, let's bring in uh, Tony. You ready? <laughs> Get the cheers <laughs> going. Let's bring yeah. him in. Sister Chief Tom Saragusa. <laughs> there he is. You, you're still there. Thank you. For not wow, look at that. Look at that man, Cape Kobe. That is a that's no she shed. I can tell you that much, bro. <laughs> that is a man cave. What's up, brothers? That mustache doing, is, Chief? is quite the mustache, too, Chief. I love it. Oh, he's got uh, he's got some good pictures. Even when he was uh, a young lad, I see. Yeah, wait till you uh... see it. Yeah, <laughs> flavor the same. Caterpillar on your face, or you just have. I've only been without this thing for. I only was without it for about four months in the last forty years. Really? Yeah. Wow. wow. Well, let's on. Got to hide something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. You know those guys with mustaches. All right, uh, guys. What's the word of the day, by the way, bro? All right. Come on. <laughs> That's an easy one. Come on. The word of the day. Let's build it up. You ready? Is here it goes. Tony. 
<laughs> the word of the day is Tony. Tony Sarah Goose. The Goose. We were going to go with Goose because everybody calls him the Goose, but the Tony goose. just Tony seemed to fit a little bit better. Yeah, we'll see. If it doesn't pan out, listen, I'll change it in the middle stream. Yeah. We'll just change it up. What what it was love? all out of love, Chief. It was all Perfect. out of love. Out of love. What years were you playing anyway in the NFL? <laughs> <laughs> I've lost a few pounds since then. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's get patriotic really quick right, before we dive into the Chiefs. So he goes way back, bro. All right, we're going we go. 76 77 with this guy. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's do it. Here we go. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the Girl, MJ from Baldwin. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Chief, welcome to the show. So we like to go way back, way back before a lot of these guys were probably even born. Uh, when you first got interested in the fire service, where, where are you from? Tell us a little about your early history, where you grew up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure for uh, being able to share some story from the West Coast or the left coast. Um, born and raised in the Sunset District of San Francisco, uh, about eight blocks from Ocean Beach, a couple blocks from Golden Gate Park, a bike ride from the Haight-Ashbury. And so the, the 60s, as you can imagine, was a pretty more than interesting time. And, and I've said recently that if you want to talk about what we've been through in the last three years, I think the last time our country was through something as crazy was that time of the 60s, 67, yeah. 68, 69, and all the stuff that was going on. History repeats itself, right? Yeah, it, it does. Um, yeah, so um, my, uh, my father passed away when I was 11 years old. Um, and I had a next door neighbor who was a San Francisco firefighter, Dominic Spinetta. And Dominic worked uh, at 45 Engine, which was not too far from, from my house. And then he was also at Six Engine and, and kind of he took me under his wing and uh, got me a little bit more than interested. Uh, the, the kind of kid that's sitting on the stoop with my buddies in the neighborhood, we had a, a radio that we'd be dialing in and listening to the fire department dispatch and getting on our stingrays and getting there before the fire department. So a uh, real working class neighborhood, half a block from the school I went to at Holy Name uh, Grammar School. Um, went to high school, Sacred Heart High School. There's three Catholic boys high schools in the city and then a bunch of public school high schools. There was a, a Catholic school high school just a few blocks from my house, but I don't want to go to that fucking place. <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> yeah, I went, to, uh, I went into the downtown, midtown uh, part of the city, the Sacred Heart High School. Uh, great education, uh, met, met a lot of people, played ball there. Um, but was still super interested in the fire department, of course. Uh, and, and you know, at the time, the competition for getting on the job anywhere was incredible, as it should be. I uh, went off to, to college and between my, uh, between my freshman and sophomore year of college, uh, Dominic said, hey, and it was a drought in California at the time, they were going to be hiring extra firefighters for 
the California Department of Forestry said, maybe you'd be interested in doing doing that. And so went through the process and and, and I think about this and I'll be as quick as I can about it. But looking oh, back on it, I remember like clear as day, my very first day of showing up, went to the to the main headquarters, got there at eight o'clock in the morning and they shipped me to a place that was about two hours away. And I got there and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. There's nobody there. And the engine shows up about, I don't know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And, and a captain who had to be a hundred years old said, what the fuck are you doing here? We don't need to you know, I'm broken. Like uh, this is my dream. He said, let me go make a couple phone calls. Fast forward. He makes a phone call. He oh, says, shit. you're not supposed to be here. You got to go to Middletown, which is another two hour drive. Holy shit. So I get up to Middletown and there's cover companies there. So I get there, it's like 7.30 at night now. And the cover companies are there and I kind of tell them what's going on. They were like, you know, here's a rack for you. Hang out here, you'll figure things out tomorrow. Well, what happens at two o'clock in the morning? Some guy's pulling me out of the bed and said, what the fuck are you doing in my rack? <laughs> <laughs> like oh my God. Rack. Oh, That's not, this is my first day. I was going to say, that you're not really starting off. But but it's like I'm, everything I'm, you're not I'm, supposed to And about. I look back and then I remember how I was feeling at the time. That next day, I'm like, this is, I'm done. I'm not. But uh, here we are, how many years later? And I remember it. I remember it. Wow. Now, you now they had no academy or anything or training. You went no. right to the. So when you got hired with them, before he can go on any calls, he had to do 40 hours of training. Right. And uh, the station that I was at, uh, it was the busiest initial attacks in the state at the time. It was during the drought years. We had an arsonist that was lighting some fires. It was just, you talk to anybody from California that has worked for, at the time was California Department of Forestry. It's now called Cal Fire. It's a great introduction into the fire service and all the excitement that goes with it. Well, what is it exactly? It's You said it wasn't the smoke jumpers. You weren't doing wildland firefighting, right? What were you doing? So California Department of Forestry is the largest department in California. They've got stations throughout the state of California, and 90% and of their mission is wildland firefighting. So you go direct on fires. You know, you start putting hose on the ground, and, you know, so, some fires you get to, you start off at 4,000 feet later, you're still, you're still laying hose, fighting fire and uh protecting structures and traveling at the time traveling from from southern california up to the oregon border and uh oh, shit. An unbelievable experience just can and, and to this day it's it's a great it's a great start for anybody wanting to get into the fire service now of course they've got higher standards and uh of what you need to have before you can get hired but it's uh it was, it was a great start so they basically did you did you live there Yes, yeah, so you worked uh, five, five days on and two days off. Oh, uh, oh shit. yeah, five days on, two days off, and of course, when your days off got canceled, you were you were on the job. You just for, continued. Just continued, and um, <clears throat> so, and I went back to school for my sophomore year, but I'm thinking the whole time I want to go back and do that. And so, after my sophomore year of college, I I went back to the same station and, and stayed on with them throughout the probably in, through November or December of. 77. Yeah. It was, uh, like I said, it was, uh, it, it just got the, the blood flowing and it ended up being something I, I wanted to do. And then, you know, you start learning about the fire service at the time, you start talking to people and you find out and like everybody else at the time, watching an emergency, the only way to get into some fire departments was to go to paramedic school. So that's I think he was in it. Yeah, there he is. Oh, <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder where she's at. <laughs> Rampart. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Dixie, remember Dixie? Talk you could, Dixie. Yeah, 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 you could have absolutely been on that show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pull that gun. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a, I went to got my EMT, went to paramedic school, and uh, got hired by the San Rafael Fire Department in uh, 1980 as a firefighter paramedic. They were. Uh, most departments at the time were taking uh, firefighters and sending them away to paramedic school. Uh, the chief in San Rafael decided to hire people that were already working as paramedics. So that's what he did. They hired nine of us at uh, the beginning of uh, 1980, January of 1980. And uh, once again, met a lot of great folks, got a lot of really good work. Uh, San Rafael 
is about 20 minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. And it was, I, I was living in the city and, and working there. I mean, I, wow, like he was a, living his best a, life there, Ruffy. Yeah. <laughs> how old was he then? He was, how old were you? you I was uh, 20, 22 years old, 22, yeah. 23 years old. Yeah, I was, uh, like I said, met a lot of good people. And they were throwing panties at him, Kobe. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was Tom Jones, his nickname was. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, San Rafael is a great, another great place to work. But as you know, native of the city, uh, my next door neighbor, you know, enticed me to come back. When I was working for the forestry, I'd actually taken the San Francisco Fire Department entrance examination along with 10,000 other folks. And uh, finally got the call. And uh, I'll never forget this other day walking into the chief's office in San Rafael on a Friday afternoon, I was starting the academy in San Francisco on Monday. I took two weeks of vacation from San Rafael just so I had a little bit of a buffer in there. And I told him, and uh, I remember he came across the desk at me, you fucking asshole, we hired you. <laughs> Going home. Oh, he was pissed off, huh? Yeah, he was upset. You know, they, they put a lot of time and money. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you got to do his I best mean, for you. Got, well, he, he, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he knew. Um, and I, in fact, I, I've seen him. Uh, he still lives in Marin County. He was a fire chief in San Rafael for like almost 35 years. Wow. But, uh, he understands. And uh, I got to go back to my hometown and the dream job uh, in the fire service for the, you know, I, I'll brag for being on the West Coast. It's the dream job on the West Coast. Absolutely. Beautiful. Tell us a little bit about the San Francisco Fire Department. How, how many companies do they have? How many members do they have? How do they ride? Stuff like that, Chief. Yeah. So, um of course, things have changed a little bit as far as the staffing was concerned when I first started. But uh, uh, when I came on the job, uh, there was uh, 43 engine companies, uh, 19 truck companies, three divisions and 10 battalions wow. broken up. Uh, you know, San Francisco is a small geographical city. That's yeah. nine square miles. It's seven by seven. So yeah, I've been to Frisco, almost, yeah. almost an engine company per, per square mile. Uh our engines are uh, four personnel, either a lieutenant and a captain and, and three. And when I came on, the trucks were six, a uh, lieutenant or captain and five. But just before the 89 earthquake, they took one of the members off the truck. So the truck is now five instead of six. Um, they have a rescue, a heavy yeah, rescue? Two, two medium heavy rescue squads, four, four person uh, squads. One of them was at the station that I retired out of, Station 7, Rescue 2. And Rescue 1 is down just south of Market. The other Station 7 there, uh, engine truck and squad on the left-hand side there. The station I worked at, the chief there was in Division 3. Uh, so Division 3 uh, had five battalions. And, uh, you know, if you took San Francisco and split it in half, it would be the south, south side of the city. Right. Uh, pretty much. Is there a crappy area? In I was just going to ask that, Roof. Is there a... Yeah, so... I don't remember I... seeing any. It looked like everything was nice. Yeah, so uh, the, the Mission District from when I first went there as a lieutenant, so I did most of my time as a firefighter at, at Station 1, um, which was uh, the Tenderloin, south of Market, a lot of uh, single-room occupancy, five, six-story, ordinary constructed buildings. Got a lot of really great work there. Uh, learned an awful lot from, you know, uh, you know, men, guys that were like dads to me. You know, took me under their wing and uh, and, and showed me the ropes. And I, I learned an awful lot from them at Station One. Um, just a, a little bit of an aside, kind of an interesting time when I came on the job. There was a lieutenant's test that took place in 1978 before I came on the job, and it expired in 1982, the year that I came on the job. And then there was a test in 83. Well, that test ended up going to court, uh, ended up in federal court. And so there wasn't a lieutenant's test from 83 through June 30th of 1988. So what they were doing because there wasn't a list, is by seniority. Uh, no firefighters way, really? Got That's firefighters crazy. getting jumped up to lieutenant. And you think about that over a five-year period of time. At, Lose you know, a lot of senior guys. All the senior guys. And guess what happened on June 30th of 1988? What's they all had there? to go back 
They all had to go back. We'll get demoted back to firefighter. Got back to firefighter. And the, the federal judge came up with a. Oh, my God. An interesting one day list of promoting 82 guys up to that. So the reason I bring that up, um, it, it was chaos for, for those make periods any sense. of time. You guys know from studying on the job, people put their. their yeah, a lot of effort and time. Yeah. Time. And to get the rug pulled out from under them. So you had a whole bunch of pretty, pretty upset folks. Um, and then what that leads to, and, I, and then I'll go back, but what that leads to is not on that one, but on the next uh, lieutenant's test, I got a job. And I'm going into houses where everybody on my crew had been a lieutenant for the previous five years. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and other things. So, uh, baptism by fire and learning to, uh, to avoid the landmines and respect people's opinions and try and just get the job done. But it, it was a pretty, pretty chaotic time. And, and from that point on, when the judge did that, the department was under a federal consent decree and it kind of changed the, I, I yeah, think yeah. it changed the, the tenor of the department quite a bit. But Cubes, back to your, your question, um, on-duty staffing for the department is 315 folks, uh, two divisions, 10 battalions, 44 engine companies, 20 truck companies in the two squads. Plus, separate to that, there's an EMS division that we run our own ambulances out of uh, a Station 49. We, we have paramedics on about 30 of our engine companies. That, that might be different uh, depending on staffing needs. Um, do the firefighters work across the floor on the buses, on the ambulances, or no? They they used to when the integration or the mergers first took place. Mm -hmm. it would be the the EMT driving a medic on the box, and the box was oh, in it's the like us, But that that went by the wayside. It it just didn't work out, and so mm -hmm. they ended up going uh, completely separate, their own station. And uh, I, I think that the guys, if they want to, if they're an EMT, they could pick up an extra watch working on the ambulance if they want. But I don't know how much that happens. I don't know how much that happens. Cap, tell me about the wooden ladders. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Thing. We, we have our own ladder shop that makes these uh, ladders. Um, that picture that you're looking at right there is our 50-foot, uh, two-section uh, wooden extension ladder with uh, the tormentor poles on the side. It's a six person raise. We are dealing with uh, a lot of overhead wires in many of our areas. And so aerial shots are a luxury, but you're, you end up throwing uh, uh, the 50 is pretty good for a roof of three window of four and with wires in the way. And the thing weighs 350 pounds. Oh, oh shit. Shit. wow. That's no joke. That thing, man. <laughs> no. Yeah, so it's, uh, it takes a lot of, uh, it, it's a dance putting it up. Uh, and, and the kind of the interesting part is, is, you know, when you're on the drill tower and you're going through pro B school, they're raising it in the same place and the same conditions. And it's pretty right, sterile. Right, right, right. And then you get out in the real world and you're trying to miss wires and you're on a 45 degree hill like this, right? Or something. <laughs> yeah, so you, you put it up on the hill. So you got to support the downhill spur. And Wow. It, but yeah, I, somebody just said a six person raise with a five man truck. <laughs> 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 Holy shit. That's See, crazy. I didn't even think about that. With firefighters, they pick up on all of that stuff. Yeah, man. Shit. So yeah, we, we, we were a six person truck company. And then just before the 89 earthquake, we went to five. So the plan is hopefully off of either the second engine company you're grabbing a firefighter or the chief's aides can have to jump in or you become very efficient on the five person race. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's ways around that. Is that the last, that's the last fire department that's doing that with the wooden. I saw a video on that, that, uh, the company that's still doing that. It's over a hundred years old, right? Or some crazy. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. So they're, they're a, a division of our, uh, department. Of oh, Public right, right, right. And, uh, just a little bit of trivia. The, the name of the carpenter that builds our ladders is called a pattern carpenter. And so they have patterns of all of those ladders that they they are able to build. It takes them quite a while to put those ladders together. But we, uh, the 50, the 35, 24, 22, 16 straight, 
and then a couple of extensions, a 12 foot baby extension and a 14 foot attic extension ladder is pretty much the complement on a, on a truck company. All of our trucks are uh, tiller trucks, uh, front mount uh, tiller trucks. Uh, when I came on the job, they were Seagraves. Now they are, I believe, Spartan um, engines. Used to be, you know, when I came on, they were uh, Ward LaFrances and then American LaFrances and then <laughs> several different companies uh, since then. There's a couple of questions in there, Con, to see to just. Yeah, I was I highlighted them. I was waiting to get for the right time to bring right. them in. Someone's asking uh, about the green lights on the front of the cab. Oops. So uh, if a, a vehicle is coming down the street and you're at the command post and you look down the street and you see a green light on the front, you know it's a truck. Oh, that's pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, okay. And what's the other one? From Gabe Fox, I think, right? Gabe Fox, he wants to know about ladders. Is, uh, is there a good reason it's still wood? <laughs> I think yeah, so uh, I, I believe that the reason that there's still wood and a good reason is you, you said it earlier, uh, we're dealing in uh, on hills, uh, windy conditions, a lot of overhead wires. So the, the weight of the ladder and the stability of the ladder when it's put up right, it's not going to be moving very much. Uh, you take a ladders aloft over those ladders, you start doing that on aluminum or fiberglass, you know, they're going to start to suffer the consequences. Uh, yeah, the, I like to think the tradition too, you know, like that's yeah, an important I, thing, I think. And I, I think besides the tradition, um, I think it brings a, a level of uh, not just pride, but behind the pride comes all of the good reasons why it, it still is a good, it still works. You know, taking out windows with a wood ladder, uh, yeah, nice. overhead wires, you hit a, you hit electrical line with a wood ladder, you know, it's going to be different than if you're doing it with aluminum or uh, right. something, something else that's going to conduct. So yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I, I hope that never changes. I hope they can continue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. What, what, what kind of, uh, I guess it's got to be a big obstacle with those big hills, right? What what kind of uh, things? What do they pose? You know, how's the rig going downhill over there? Yeah. So <laughs> shit. Yeah, I'm trying to find uh, something. A little bit, you know. Of course, going through the history of going down hills, and I'll just a real quick one. Uh, and I don't know how this happened. The department decided that they were going to buy two aerials from a crane company, and these things were behemoth. They were so freaking big. The aerial took a long time to go up. And the only way that they decided that they made a mistake was when it was parked on Powell Street one day at an incident and it started sliding down the hill. Because the brake couldn't even hold it. <laughs> it couldn't even hold it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, hillsides for angle of approach and departure, um, whether you're even going to bring the truck onto the block or not. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alleys and, and tight streets, like if you get into, up into Chinatown and some areas up on Vernal Heights where the streets are narrow. But the, the hills can, can be a problem. And when you're talking about ladder company operations, if you're going to be able to get an aerial shot with a truck on a hill, uh, you want to be on the downhill side, uh, raising back up so you're going to get that angle. Because if you're on the uphill side, you end up with a flat ladder. If you want to be on the downhill side, uh, there you go. Is that uh, one of them? It's kind of hard to make out. I was trying to see if this was one of the old ones you were talking about. Uh, it's... Uh, Man, that sure looks like it. Yeah, that's the crane right there. They ended, wow. up, send, they ended up sending it out the line, and it died, they died miserable deaths out of four <laughs> Somebody yeah. shoot that thing. Yeah, yeah. They, they <laughs> were, oh. And uh, one of them, one of them during morning checks at Station One, because they put one at one gotcha. and one at thirteen trucks during morning checks. It it leaned over as they were raising it up. It kind of just fell over into the building. They had to get another crane to. Oh, oh goodness gracious. Today. Call up the chief. Hey, come out here. We have something to show you. Yeah. Bring your 12 gauge. I'd like to be sitting on that meeting. <laughs> hey, I got a good idea. <laughs> yeah. That's a great example for any anybody out there that thinks they have a great idea. Is you better share it with the troops before you decide to put yeah. something like that in no service. Doubt. Um, but yeah, the, the, the streets uh, and the hills and the overhead wires, it, it's a challenge, but it's, I'm not going to say it's fun, but it's, the challenge is exciting. Yeah. Now that uh, the only street I know, what's that? The Crooked Street, Lombard Street. Oh, Lombard Street. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Catch, you ain't... catch a job on that street? No, I no? don't know. If there's ever been one on the Crooked part. There's been fires on Lombard, but not that. It's a one block section. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's only one block there. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, go somebody straight in down the, chat, the middle anyway. Somebody in the chat wants to know if, the, if San Francisco went through the, the Warriors like the New York did in the 70s, 60s. Yeah, so um, prior to my coming on the job there, you, you heard from the old timers about late 60s and the 70s when it was the Western edition and the Hunter's Point that they were getting a lot of fire. So the Western edition, just north of Market Street, uh, west of Van Ness Avenue, and east of probably Divisadero, a lot of two and three story row type homes. We call them flats in the cities, right. in the city. So the flats, uh, you'll have three doors at the front, stoop, uh, the three doors, and the outside door goes to the top floor, middle door, of course, goes to the middle, and left one will go, or the, the one towards the inside will go to the, the bottom floor. And uh, what's fascinating about that from the lore of our department is that a busy company at the time was 21 Engine, and uh, there was a captain there uh, named Smale, his last name was Smale. And he was the first to introduce into our department the use of the two and a half. Uh, 100 foot pre-connected two and a half because you get one of those plays going, uh, get quick dock down with that two and a half. But over the years, it was, I'm not going to say it was part of the struggles and it maybe continues to be. And I, I'm not here to offend anybody that's still on the job. But the two and a half is not a respected line as it should be in our job in, in the city. They don't use it very often. Um, but Tom Smale was using it on 21 engine back in the 70s with a lot of uh, with a lot of success. A lot of success. It ain't easy, that's for sure. Well, hell yeah. no. Especially when you operate it by yourself, Rufi, with some guys trying to destroy <laughs> you on a drill and humble you. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah I remember what that. they did have is they had a three-inch line with a shutoff on it and a like a stream straightener with an inch and a quarter tip on the end of it, and then the, another tip on the end of that. So that was like Three a laser guys. beam. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was, it was cutting steel with that. <laughs> Take an eye out. 400 gallons of water per minute. But, yeah. Uh, Cut steel with that baby. What, exactly. now what, what kind of response do you get on a, on a box uh, or, or work and file? What, what do you guys call it? What signal is a work and file? So it's a box. So we get a box, a reported address of uh, fire in the building. So on a box, you would get a, you'd get a division chief. Used to be two battalions, but I understand they scaled back and now they're getting one battalion. Three engines, two trucks, a rescue squad, and a medic unit. Oh, we, get a big response. we got about 30 to 35 folks showing up on reported structure fire. Uh, nice. It goes to a working fire. It's, if it's declared a working fire, you get another engine company to be the Rick engine or to fill in the role of Rick or like for you guys, the fast company right? and a, uh, a rescue captain, which is a paramedic captain that shows up for that. And then as you go to a greater alarm, you get four engines and two trucks and a battalion chief for each additional alarm up to five. Oh, that's after that's the very similar. Alarm, very close. Yeah. After the fifth alarm, it goes to special calls. We don't have a sixth alarm or seventh alarm. We don't either. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, we have we got to hit it fast and hard with a lot of folks because we know if we don't get it uh, with the first couple of lines, it's going to be yeah, in the yeah. buildings right now. Let's get right, into his. Uh, let's yeah, get back to your career, Chief. So yeah, because we kind of got off talking about San Francisco uh, a little bit. So you get assigned, right? Yeah. How long was the academy there that you went through? It was a six week academy. Uh, six weeks of, you know putting on an air pack, uh, stretching lines, throwing mm -hmm. ladders. Of course, the tying of the knots. You know, you tie those knots and they don't see the knots for the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, hanging a deer or working on your yeah. boat. <laughs> so you go to the dumps and tie down your load. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so six weeks in the, uh, in the academy. And then I was assigned to Station 1. Mm -hmm. And Station 1 is a uh, – it's not – it's no longer in the current in the location where it was when I was on. Uh, it used to be on Jesse Alley, engine truck and rescue squad there. And I was a. It felt like I was the luckiest guy in the world to be able to spend the. Other than four months, I was. I did four months on the truck, and then I went to ten engine, and then the captain got me back to one, and I was what you called unassigned. So I bounced between the engine truck and squad. And so every day I came to work, I could be driving the truck, I could be tillering, I could be on the squad, I could be driving the engine. That's Even that month. early on, huh? Yeah. Wow. I mean, it was, uh, 
you you you, you got thrown into the. I was just going to say they threw you, you into the fire. It, you know, you either <laughs> were able to pass muster or not. But it was a uh, what a great way to learn. And I the, the names of the cat, you know, Captain Mike Sullivan, George Politis, Dave Frizzella, uh Bill Keating, the best boss I ever worked with in my life. He was. And I, I know you have them like this on your job. Nothing got them phased. Yeah, Everything great. was cool, calm and collected. Hey, Tommy, hook up to the standpipe. I'm going to go up and see where the fire's at. I'll be right back. And you're shitting your pants. And he, and goes, he comes down <laughs> with his hair on fire. He's like, God, it's all good up there. <laughs> he goes on the left. That's on yeah. the left. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit. Was he a vet? Was he a vet? He, he was not a vet. He had a brother on the job. His, I, I think his dad was on the job, but he wasn't a vet. Um, but just... Uh, a, a classy guy, but you know, going back after reminding you, there was a lot of turmoil in the department at the right, time. Right, so right, I was trying right. to, you know, kind of skirt around that. And uh, but yeah, I got a, a couple of interesting calls uh, that I was involved with. Uh, but I, as it plays out, my very first night in the fire the house at Station One, just after dinner. Now, I told you I. And was a paramedic. And so I worked on my days off from San Rafael. I worked as a city paramedic. And so I knew some of the guys that were on the job. So just after dinner that night of my first night, the rescue squad gets a call for a, a p- pedestrian pinned under a bus up on O'Farrell street. So the Lieutenant of the squad, Jimmy Lyon says, come on, kid, you're going with us. So sure enough, get up there. And uh guy's leg had been amputated just above the knee and so I got my belt off and I'm holding the, the, a, a tourniquet. I know the ambulance crew that shows up. I end up going out the hospital. Get back to the firehouse. We have a fire just across the street in the Chronicle Hotel, uh, room and contents fire. And then about one o'clock that morning, we get a third alarm down on 6th Street. Wow. At the uh, Mental Lee Hotel, 6th and Howard. And up on the roof with uh, Steve Flaherty and Jerry Cohane. And no saws, all axe work. Uh, my girl. Ooh. When men were men. It must have been yeah. like, this Tony guy is a real black cloud. <laughs> <laughs> but I oh, know. Tony, hold Tony, on a there you Tony. go. Tony. There you catch <laughs> <All right. laughs> I remember I didn't shower on purpose because my roommate was a San Rafael fireman, and I get home, and Give I want to Give him a smell. sniff, baby. Give him a smell. smell. <sighs> you walk in there, you go, you smell right. something? Let me smell fire. Yeah. Oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's my new cologne. It's called yeah. Doing Old Work, baby. Flame. Yeah. Old Flame. Old Doing it. But Doing it was, just, I mean, once again, you, you just get drawn into it. And it's like you can never get those highs ever again because you, know, you experience it the first time and you continue to look for it. And uh, it, it was uh, unbelievable. And it was like uh, the best thing that could have happened. Chief, I say, I've said that on the show, you know, since being retired. There really is nothing that gives you that adrenaline rush, like you know, when you know you're going to something, and uh, you know, or you turn the corner and you see fire out the window. You know, there's nothing that gets you as amped up as that in any. I don't know anything. I mean, the whole thing is like an opera, right? You get the calls, the whole crescendo building up, bro. You drive, you're getting calls now. You're driving like a madman, the siren, the horns. Yeah, you get there. And I think that. The, the adrenaline junkies are looking for that for the, you know, you're looking for it for the rest of your career. Oh yeah. You keep chasing it. One, one of the other things, and, and I'm sure probably can relate to this, of, of course, on your job, I find it interesting that a lot of guys on our job, their careers kind of take the path of whatever house they went to first. You know, it's like, Oh yeah, no doubt. You, when you end up at a place and you're, you're, you're going to jobs and you're treated with respect and you're breaking chops you're looking for that. And I'm not, I'm not disrespecting those places that don't do that, but some people get comfortable in those places and they end up staying in there. Right. So I think it's probably something inherent in the fire service, wherever you come out of proby school and you go to first kind of sets the tone for If, if you know, <laughs> the only thing that would change that is if you know how the job is, if you have family on the job or something That's and you right. don't go to a place that is giving you that, then you'll see a lot of guys move very quickly to, right, yeah. to go to a place. Or if, if somebody in that firehouse sees that this is a young there. right, this this guy, <laughs> yeah. this guy's gonna be good for the job. And right, he's yeah. like, You gotta get the hell out of here, kid. You know, I'm yeah. gonna help you. And and that has happened too. But there is the that time. Too. Like I tell guys when I see him in the gym and they tell me they just got on, but I'm in a real slow place. I'm like, get out of there before you get complacent because exactly. 
you you become part of your environment. You get complacent. Mm-hmm. You're like, ah, but maybe I don't want to. You know. Yeah, listen, that's right. listen. We say it on the show too, right? There's a seat for every ass, and yeah, uh, you know some guys have side jobs and you know whatever. It, it is what it is. As long as they do the job when they're there, you know they're happy with not going to that many jobs. That's fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh. And you know, Lou, you just said uh, guys having side jobs. Well, I remember when I first came on the job. Even and Station One was the busiest house in the city. We ran with uh, three forty-one and thirty-six and competed with them all the time. But one was a really busy, really busy house. Everybody, when you came downstairs in the morning, everybody was going to their hobby job. Yeah, all right, you got to dig <laughs> over in. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but guys, everybody was going to their hobby job. Guys were painting. They were carpenters. It was just the way of the world at the time. Yeah, you have to do it. You had to you do it. To. You had no choice but to go and do some hobby job to pick up a couple of bucks. But I, I don't see that happening as much anymore. Chief, uh, that's my old lieutenant who, who said, unless you have too many Italians, because when I came there, we had like three, three or four Italians came in. And of course, his name is Patty Lee. Oh, you know? Patty Lee. Patty Lee. And we yes. burned down a couple so, of buildings like, on his block, so he yeah. wasn't happy with yes, it. Yes, allegedly. So, Chief, when, when you fir- <laughs> when first went to one, <clears throat> where do you think you enjoyed working the most? The engine, the truck, or the rescue? I- I'm telling you straight up right now, on the truck, when we were six on the truck, two of us, we were called the fire escape. We throw the fire escape. So, throw the 22 or the 24. So, you and your partner throw the fire escape ladder. And instead of the drop ladder like you use, we would throw the ladder up, tie it off, and then that crew went to the roof. So you end up being like your roof guy. And to me, the, the fire escape on one truck or three truck was like the, the best job in the world. Because no radios. You got to the roof. You had to make decisions. You got to look at the light wells, the side of the buildings, uh, the rear. Now, you have to remember in the city, because of the way the buildings are, you're not getting the back of the building until somebody gets up on that roof and gives right. the chief support. So it was a big deal, and we didn't have radio, so you'd be talking into the squawk box on the end of the aerial to tell the driver, hey, tell the chief. Oh, the hey, chief, no that. shit, yeah, yeah. It's blowing out of three windows at the so, rear. Or it's so in the things light. are delayed, obviously, right? Exactly. So uh, if I, like the dream job was being on the fire escape at one truck. It was unbelievable. Get a good partner, the two of you would just, Get up, get the bulkhead door. If it wasn't a top floor fire, you'd work your way down. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have any one ladder, one truck stories that you can share with us? Um, I was at actually, it wasn't on one truck. I was on the rescue squad one day, and there had been a, a fire at an old sporting goods store, and it was abandoned. Fire, a uh, couple of lines get stretched, the fire's knocked, and I was on the squad, and I learned quickly when it's time to go and the squad is go you, you you're you not picking up you're just going you better not touch any fucking hose you get yelled at by the other <laughs> <laughs> so i remember just getting to the back of this uh the rescue squad and uh one of the drivers said hey somebody just went down inside like what were you talking about well a fireman from three engine had fallen into an elevator shaft oh uh because it was it was an open it had been a fire there before and uh, I'm going to laugh about this. I probably shouldn't. But anyway, I get up there and uh, the, the chief of the time knew that I'd worked as a medic. He said, get down there. And so they tied me off and they lowered me down. And I'm checking this guy out. Well, this guy had a like a, a storied history of always being in shit and used to hang out at a, at a drinking establishment all the time. And that's kind of a little bit of a side. And I get down to him. He's, he's alert and I'm checking him out. And I said to him, I said, well, the only thing I see is you got a shiner on your eye. He says, I got that last night. Last night at the- <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Get him out of there. Um, and then another time on the on the rescue, uh, we were on a call. We got special called all the way over to uh, North Beach. And it was just before the Democratic convention that was happening in the city. And they were doing a bunch of construction. And there was a cable car turnaround construction site. And a bus had been coming up the hill and took the right-hand turn onto uh, Jefferson Street and lost control and ran up into the bus stop. And there was a bulkhead of concrete. When it ran over the bulkhead, there was a 30-foot drop. And so the bus is kind of teetering there. And when we get there, there's people all over the place. And Mm -hmm. I hear some screaming. 
and there's a woman trapped under the bus and her legs are on that concrete bulkhead with the bus on top of her legs. Holy, Holy shit. So mm. now mm. the guys and it, we didn't have any airbags at the time. We had a purse tool and a couple of bottle floor jacks. I ended up getting under there and kind of figuring out what was going on. And one of her legs was already gone, mm. was able to get that out. But one of her other legs was just being held on by just a little bit. And uh, I, I had to make the call and, and, and take, take get the Get out of here. Holy and they, shit. Yeah. And got her out of there. And uh, yeah, she ended up living and uh, I ended up meeting her after that. Wow. It was an interesting, interesting uh, Talk about making a move to cut a leg off. Like, well, oh, I mean, there was no, there was you no have no choice. Yeah, yeah I know. Gonna die. Yeah. They, were Skin left. For, they were calling for a tow truck to hold the bus from slipping over this edge. Um, and doing it, you had to get a medal for that. Did you get something for that? I Being under that got, bus, yeah, these medals behind me, I got a medal for that. I was I gonna, gonna say, when you're working under a teeter totting bus, yeah, cutting yeah. the leg, leg off. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, those years at one, uh, I. I, I cherish them. I met a lot of really good folks. And uh, I, th I think when I was talking to Lou, uh, when we first talked on the phone, you know, there's a lot of things that you do that you don't realize that you're doing because you saw your bosses do it in the past. It's like you've taken a little bit of all of those guys that you worked with and two things, whatever they did well and you admired, you try and do it. And what they effed up, yeah, I ain't doing it that way, right? right. But, Cross it off the list. Yeah, right. Hey, how would you have done it? I ain't doing it that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a, it was a fun time. Uh, which leads into, uh, I told you what happened on June 30th of 88. All of the promotions take place. And there's a little bit of, I'm not, I, everybody's pissed off. And so I decided to take a different path and become a chief's aide. And so there was a class and you took a test and got the chief's aide job. And I was... Uh, Assigned out to Battalion 10 with a chief named Dave McCarroll. Uh, just a, you know, a, another guy you can learn an awful lot from and uh, working with him on the day of the earthquake. And Battalion 10 was in the same district as Candlestick Park. Holy so shit, you were right in there, man. Yeah, we, were right in the, we were right in the thick of it. Um, wow. But it, being a chief's aide was a great way to kind of absorb how things happen from the command post perspective and, and listen to the chief and kind of figure out their decision-making process. So I, 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 not that I enjoyed the position, but it was an opportunity to learn more of the job. I tell guys all the time, chief, like the last, when I was on medical leave, my brother was a deputy chief. I drove him the last year. And I think everybody should have to do a short time driving the chief because it gives you a different perspective from the outside looking in. You get a better understanding of what they you go. You said that a lot about that. Yeah. Exactly what the chief just said. You said yeah. that. Exactly. Makes you and, more well-rounded. Uh, uh, a good operator yeah. is worth their. We call them operators or chiefs aid. Uh, they he is his weight in gold, man. They yeah. are uh, when the shit's hitting the fan and he's making decisions before the chief says it because he knows what he's going to say anyway. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I had the the woman that was my aide uh, when I retired. It was one of those I didn't even have to say anything. Right. right. She, she was asking for a second alarm and control all the folks that were coming in, and I, I had a lot of them. That picture that. Uh, uh, I have a, one of my aides when I was, uh, we, we got an award for uh, the Asiana airplane crash. Carol Conley was just, you, you don't know. Yeah, Carol is just, uh, what she was saying on the radio while I was trying to deal with everything that was going on that day was, you, you listen to it afterwards and, you know, much respect to Carol and what she was able Your to goal, do. right? Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. And it could be so, the exact opposite if you didn't oh, have somebody who maybe took that spot for, for whatever reason, wrong reasons, would, yeah, right. for the wrong reason, it, it might not go right. as smooth, obviously. And when the shit's hitting the fan and you have yeah, you don't want that shit. Right? You're doing two jobs, right? You're doing their job and you're right. doing your right, job. Right, right. Yeah, I had a different, little bit of a different relationship with my brother, too, because I could maybe get away from things. You know, like, <laughs> like, maybe, like maybe he'd come out in the morning and I'd be at the desk naked with just my boots on. <laughs> just see I'm just saying that might have happened. I don't know. Yeah. Allegedly. 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 Would you, yeah, phone, yeah. would you phone ahead to wherever you were going to be going and saying, "Hey, the chief's coming by"? And no, he's no, oh, no, 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 no. Well, that I, listen, I know, <laughs> I know my my limitations. That I would not do. The guys yeah. did do that in Brooklyn. Oh, they did oh that my god, they, that they did time. that a lot. They would say, "Listen, the chief's coming by." I'm like, all right, everybody, put you put the right shirt yeah, yeah. on. The chief's coming by. Yeah, yeah. Especially at five o'clock. See, my brother was slick. Though he used to do tell the aide 
a different firehouse that he was going. He would say, "We're going over to two and a quarter." Today no or shit. But he would That's actually sneaky. say, "All right, go." Oh man, yeah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You little bastard. <laughs> Why the hell would you want to catch guys without their shit on? Let them, you know, you might as well call over there. And let he, them he don't think, I don't even care about that. He wanted to make sure they were drilling or doing something. You know, he ain't lying. Yeah. Yeah. He ain't lying. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So when did oh. you get? When did he get promoted, Coops? I don't Hold even know on, let me get back on track. Here. I'm having a good go. time. I think I'm gonna go on right now and say we found our guy. We found our, our West no, Coast I like guy it. halfway uh, through. I told. Did I tell halfway you? Through, I halfway I through. Halfway through. Speaking of West Coast, we'll have to go back in an episode or two ago that we were talking about some kind of ventilation or positive pressure. Oh. oh. <laughs> say <Now> we, <laughs> we gotta wait for that. That we, we gotta get through. That'll be yeah, the we'll end. Chief, we'll talk about we'll that. Get there, but, um, yeah, let's now we can have our true east coast left coast debates, Roof. You know what I mean? Because we got yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I hear a fan what? operating on the fire ground, I'm going to put a fucking shotgun in it. No, all right, all right, another so we, 12 uh, gauge. yes, yeah, yeah, all right. So then you go, uh, Lieutenant, you, you're with the Chief Stage from 88 to 89, and then you go to truck seven, engine 10, engine six, 89 to 93. Yes, uh. But I, I I told you earlier it was a it was a difficult time, but a great learning opportunity to deal with. Uh, guys are pissed off. You know, I'm coming on into their firehouse. They've been lieutenant for the last five or six years. Now they're 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 back riding the rear seat or they're driving. You know, like which way do you want me to drive? You get over that because you have to you have to prove yourself by uh, treating them with respect and understand mm -hmm. where they're coming from. I, I really enjoyed Engine 6. Engine 6 is right in the uh, upper market area. Uh, it's got a real, lot of uh, really good first-in uh, fires there on the engine. Uh, really good crew. I mean, so so that was it. I was 32 years old, and I'm a lieutenant. I would say the youngest guy at 6 Engine was probably early 50s. They were all seeing <laughs> Uh, What's up, kid? It was a great firehouse. Well, so you didn't say much, right, Chief? Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I was in the same boat. <laughs> yeah, but it was a it, it was a great learning opportunity because you figured out what battles to pick. Or what yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Battles not to pick. That's a good point. That's a good point. And being able to listen and find, like I remember one guy, uh, Pete Brandt. Uh, he'd been a lieutenant, temporary lieutenant for five years, and now he's my driver, and he's just pissed off at the world. But I found common ground with him when we started talking about basketball. He was a high school basketball guy. And at the time, Jason Kidd was playing at Oakland Tech over in the East Bay. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, when I was at Station 1. I'm on the far right there. Uh, okay. I thought it was just uh, tied into what you were talking about. My apologies. Oh, that's cool. No, that's good. Uh, but my point is, is that when you're dealing as a boss, um, you have to be able to figure out – how you can pull the best out of people. You can always mess with the worst part of people, but it's it's not worth it. And uh, it was a it was a great, and, and I use it to this day in the classes that I'm teaching as the opportunity for growth as a boss, picking your battles, setting expectations, and you know sometimes you got to say knock it off, right? And you got to say knock it off. It's time to knock it off. Right. Tighten did, the bolts. Did any of them ever get you really close where you're like. Yeah, I know. Oh. I know. And you pick up the phone and you phone another chief or you phone up the chief and you say, I need help. And they go, figure it out. And you figure it out. You know, right. figure it out. But no, and then, uh, yeah, I, it was a short, I'm not going to say a short time as lieutenant, but it was an opportunity for growth as lieutenant. But uh, of course, a lot of retirements were taking place because of the whole consent decree that was happening and studied for the captain's test. And I got a captain's job in 93. And, uh, Bounced around a little bit as a captain. Uh, I was out at 14 truck, 22 engine, but I, I was able to find my home at truck seven, uh, which is in the mission district, which is in the same house that I retired out of, which um, captain of a truck with a good crew. When you're working in the oh, uh, yeah. area of the city where you're throwing ground ladders a lot, you're training an awful lot. The, the training division is right next door. So you have the access to the tower and, and uh, you know, it was a great opportunity for growth and learn a lot there. There's a front of the firehouse. That's uh that's station seven and most of the crew. Now a, a real quick story. You see that guy on the left. Uh, he Can was my 
50. Uh, Robert Dotson. I'll tell you about his first day uh, when he was the a guy pro- leaning over. The guy pointing. Just like leaning pointing. The guy leaning over uh, uh-huh. all the way up against the post there. So when I was at six as a lieutenant, he got assigned to me as a proby. It was his second house. He was coming from 18 truck and coming into six as a, a brand new firefighter. And about 10 o'clock that morning of his first day, he says, hey, Lieutenant, uh, you think it'd be okay for me to get out this afternoon? I got a basketball game. I go, what the, f- you're a brand new, what are you talking about? He goes, I got somebody coming in. And well, I, what, what are you going to say? You're going to say, no, it's your per- first day. And well, the phone starts ringing, right? The phone starts ringing from all the basketball guys. They need Robert to be at their game. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, Brothers have their priorities. <laughs> you know, uh, but I break his chops to the say he just retired. Uh, he just retired a couple years ago, and we same keep firehouse. It. He was still in there. No, that was it. He retired out of seven. Uh, uh-huh. No, it's not okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's cool. Uh, yeah, he retired out of station seven. He he was there for almost his entire career. Yeah, uh-huh. that's what I mean. Yeah, that's great. Now, I, I know they talk about this on the news all the time. How, how bad is the homeless situation there? Does it? Oh mean? fuck! <laughs> that bad. Um, I, I, you know, I was born and raised uh, out in the Sunset District, which is out towards the beach, and we had to go downtown every once in a while when we were kids. And you know, when when I was a kid, they were called hobos, right? They were just like hanging out on the corner, and they weren't a problem. But it looks like a third world third country. World country right? Yeah, it's, it's sad. Uh, it's a it's a huge challenge to the firefighters. Uh, and I'll give you an example. And you've seen the pictures of what a homeless encampment could look like. Oh my God! You, it's you get a phone call. You get a phone call for somebody that's sick in a homeless encampment, and you're the engine company that's showing up, and they say he's in that tent. Are you going to go into that tent? I, I, told my goes, I, I put a, I put a drafted a memo when I was in the division. I said, nobody goes into a tent. If you have somebody that's sick in the tent, get a knife, cut the tent open and drag them out. But, and, and the reason for that is somebody very close to me who was one of my aides. She, she called me up one day and said, uh, Hey chief, I've got MRSA of the lungs. And she goes, I think I know exactly where I got it. I was on this call and, so there's a lot of disease that's out there and, and the expectation for first responders to deal with the piss, the shit, the needles. Oh yeah. The human look at this. I mean, it's and then wow. when you get one of those places going, you know, they get a fire in them, you know what they have in there? They have propane tanks, they have right, batteries. They're trying to stay warm, right? Right. Um wow. let me also just say this, and I probably should end with this that San Francisco's homeless budget is 700 million dollars oh my god the fire department's what? budget is about three what that's fucking incredible 700 million dollars <laughs> that's incredible yeah. and, it's, that's and they're not insane. doing anything to help it i don't know you can't, get, to, you can't get into the politics of it it'll drive you to drink I, oh wait no thank you <laughs> yeah. what? <laughs> what what hold on a minute <laughs> what, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's 700 million. Seven hundred million. about incentivizing the homelessness. Well, that, here's the deal. If you are assigned to be a worker, are you going to want the problem to go away? No, you want it to keep going, right? You keep getting paid, man. I'll get off that. I'll get off that. So no, far. it was good to, to talk yeah. about it because, like you said, the guys are, and gals are going fighting. into that stuff. Yeah. And yeah. the fires that you're getting, and uh, and, and it's it's uh, political is not the right word, but you know, it's interesting when something curious has happened in the city, like the Super Bowl or a convention, how all of a sudden an area of the city that was covered in homeless folks, all of a sudden it's cleaned up. Yeah, right, right, right. right? Come on. It Come is. on, man. Good thing it doesn't get below zero there because you'd have bumpsicles like we have. You know? Yeah, <laughs> you get bumpsicles. <laughs> we used to get bump- but- Yeah, like- but you know what? I, I've been there. I, I, I don't know if I said it to you earlier, but my, my daughter and her family live at 57th and 3rd, and... You know, you don't see a tent anywhere. You see a couple of people sitting on the sidewalk, but you go around this in San Francisco right now. It's it's pretty. Yeah, they bad. stay in the subways when it gets cold because it's a little yeah. warmer down there. Yeah, <clears throat> but I was in Pittsburgh and they're all over the place too. They got those yeah. camps all on their bridges. I'm like, what the hell's going on in this country, man? What? 
What? <laughs> what? I gotta do that one more time. Hold on. It doesn't get old. What? what? <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. Where are we? What do we got? <laughs> We're a captain. We're a captain 22, truck 14, truck 7, 93 to 2001. Yeah, so I um I was a so uh we you bid for your spots in the city by seniority. You were able to bid for a spot and, and make it and it's uh once you make a spot, it's yours forever. Uh so a firefighter can bid bid a spot. And so I was able to bid and make truck seven, uh a spot that I always wanted to go go to. And we got a lot of work, a lot of ladder work, a lot of top floor fire work, um, getting above the fire, opening up. Uh just the, the the stuff that you dream of, and you, you get your crew to a, a, a place where, you know, you don't even have to say anything, right? You just they, they go to work, and that's uh, the best, man. That's, that's the, the best. Plus. It was. Uh, you're all on the same page, off. and they buy into it. When they all yeah. buy into what you're selling, cap, right? I mean, you're the head guy, and uh, you know, you got your young guys, you got the old guys buying into it. Everybody's on pay on on the same page. Um, everybody's and on you, point. You can do that with, you know, you don't have to make it like a, a burden for people. You just have to say follow me and you know this is what we're doing that drill at one o'clock out in the yard or you know yeah it was a it, it was a good crew i enjoyed working with uh with them and the and the work that we have and and in that in that house there's a division chief and you you learn an awful lot about what's going on in the department too by paying attention uh to to kind of the scuttlebutt of, of what's happening so being uh the captain of the truck was um you know, you asked me earlier, my dream spot down at station one was being on the fire escape of, of one truck. I think the best officer's job and our, our job is a, a captain of a truck company of a busy working truck. Company. I would, would say that on our job too. the captain is really the best spot. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. It, was a, it was a joy, but one of the, not the downsides of how things were because there was so much movement in the department, you know, you're, you're a captain in a spot and every once in a while they're grabbing you to go out as a chief. And which is a great way to learn. You get your feet wet. Uh, you, you learn a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I got I got hit in the nose pretty hard. Uh, December of 1997. I was working out in Battalion 10, uh, which is out in the Bayview Hunters Point area. And uh, a little bit after 1:30 in the morning, we get a call of a fire in the building, and. The, the crews, uh, everybody, lines were stretched, doors were forced, searches were done. We lost six people at the fire, a grandmother, mother, and four babies, four kids. And wow. it, it fucking broke me, man. It was uh, one of the, you know, because, you know, I, I remember I remember standing out in front. I sent my aide off to kind of figure out what was going on. It was three engines, a truck, and myself. That's what we sent at the time. And a uh, bunch of people outside. It was kind of really weird that we got there and there was a bunch of people from the neighborhood that were outside. I uh, learned later there was a delay in the, uh, in the alarm. Um, but uh, I, I wrote an article about it. And if you ever get a chance to look it up, it's called Just In For The Day. And it really captures the, you know, the reason that we do this job and that when you come to work every day, you can worry about all the other shit, right? You can worry about, you know, where are you going camping this weekend or the car that you're working on? But when you're on the job, you got to be fucking ready, right? You got to be ready. And the the guys that night gave it their all, but the results were horrible. Just horrible. Listen, that happens, right? You could be, yeah. you know, it just happens. You, there's nothing you could do. Some fires are well advanced. Sometimes it's just, yep. you know, bad luck. I mean, it just happens. You can't do that, everything. And to your point, the point of that is, you have to be on your game because if you're one of those guys that doesn't give a fuck about the job and you're off doing all your other stuff, how do you deal with yourself when you're not there, right? You're not on your game. And so, if you could have made a difference and you weren't prepared to execute at that time, that's the key. Yeah, yeah exactly. And you know, if you're prepared to execute and it just it's just not going your way, not, or you have true. bad luck, or the fire was too advanced, then there's nothing yeah. you could do that, and then you could live with yourself. But you're just going to hurt. Right. Yeah. yeah. It does. Yeah. I've seen I've seen grown men cry in the street saying to the chief they just they couldn't get to the we lost they lost the kid yeah. and they were literally crying in the street because they couldn't get to the kid and yeah, it, 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 it we all felt that way yeah. and so it was a 
it was a paradigm shift in the way that I thought. I mean, um, not that I was going to do anything different, but I was going to take it to the next level and always be as prepared as I could be and take the job as seriously as I could. Uh, more because of who we serve, but also to protect myself and be able to say to myself, I was ready to execute and, and do the job. Right. That was a tough one. Yeah. I'm sure. Not many. It's it, it's tough when you lose one. I mean, the whole family like that. Yeah. 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 Brutal. I had a very then, similar scenario just like that where we lost the whole family. I think it was five kids and, and the parents mm. for a nonsense fire. Exactly. And this was one of those guys smoking on the couch. He goes to try and put it out. He can't put it out. He leaves by the front door, leaves the front door open. It came right in the front door and went right up the stairs and they had nowhere to go. And um, yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> to me, that was just an eye opener for the emotional part of the job. And I, I, I know that you uh, put the website up there earlier about people that struggle with things and it's, it's always going to be with you. Uh, and to your point, when you're ready to, to get it done, but it's past that tipping point, you have to be able to be able to say to yourself, you gave it your best shot. Your best shot. Yeah, Cap. I want to go back just a little bit first because we you talked about uh, the earthquake a couple of times. Just give yeah. us a quick insight to what was going on, what what you saw, and yeah, it was. Uh, so we know it was the third game of the World Series. Uh, I was working driving Dave McCarroll in Battalion Ten. Uh, I went upstairs to the to the to the gym to jump on the bike to watch the first part of the game, and I had just got on the bike, and it was like somebody was picking me up and dropping me. Like, boom, boom, boom. Like, and I'm like, what the fuck? And when I went to get off, I ended up falling off the bike. And you come downstairs, and it looked just like, I don't know, like a movie scene. There's a Bruxton water pipes in the street. There's water sloshing out of the sewer system. And, like, the light went on for me. I said, holy shit, Candlestick Park is not too far away from here, and 60,000 people in the park. I... I like I said, born and raised in the city, so I would experienced a number of earthquakes, but nothing like that one. What year was that? 89. 80, 89. 89, okay. What, what yeah. was that up, uh, on the Richter scale? What was that? It was, uh, oh, okay. was six, six, eight, I think. Wow. <clears throat> it was uh, 60 miles south of the city in Loma Prieta. Uh, and we remember the pictures of uh, the Oakland uh, freeway. The bridge, right? It collapsed. Oh, collapsed. Right, right, right. The bridge, uh, we lost a section of the Bay Bridge. Right, right, right. Uh, and one of the things that kind of a little bit of an aside, our, our response was incredible. Um, we didn't have a lot of fires at first. And then the marina lit up uh, down in the marina where we had a bunch of buildings that collapsed. And then the recall goes out and everybody comes back to work. One of the things that I haven't touched on is that the, uh, the equipment for our job, there isn't a lot of re relief. Yeah. There's the, uh, the Cypress structure of the uh, 880 southbound in, wow. in Oakland, where it was just a collapse and people were trapped in there. And um, that was on the other side of the other side of the bay. But it, it was a, an incredible, incredible event. We had a, a bunch of uh, firefighters return to work, but we didn't have any equipment to put them on. So, you know, then you're taking turns going out the door with whoever gets on the rig goes and then it turned into a it wasn't um, it wasn't as organized as it should have been, but I think it wasn't on the part of the firefighters. It was the city's lack of investment in uh, equipment for people when they come back to work. Of course, after that, there was a, a, a lease purchase to get more engines, but really our, our department still struggles to this day with having enough relief for a, a city like san francisco where you know you're going to have that event yeah right? you're going to have it so it's not if it's when. We, like you need to have some uh some equipment in depth um yeah but the number of calls that we had you know we sent the engine companies out and did a survey of their area and got some reports back found out pretty quickly that campus Park was still in pretty good shape uh the truck company from the station i was at nine truck they ended up going all the way down into the marina uh, fireman Jerry Shannon made an incredible rescue down there, was able to cut in with the chainsaws and cribbing and pull a, uh, an elderly woman out of her place down in the marina. So a lot of really good work happened that night. Uh, power was out in the city for some period of time, but restored fairly quickly. 
I remember there was a lot of gas. I guess the, the fire started from the gas. Is that what would ha ended up happening, right? Yeah, so uh, you get gas line ruptures and uh, gas lines. Uh, people calling up about smell of natural gas, and so you're chasing that uh, down a little bit. Another curious part about the city, um, and I know maybe you've heard of this or not, we have an unusual water, uh, uh, additional water supply for firefighting. It's our auxiliary water supply system. So San Francisco has three holding tanks for our high pressure water system, Jones Street, Ashbury, and Twin Peaks. Mm. We have these uh, larger high pressure hydrants besides the domestic system that we were able to supply those hydrants with uh, water primarily for firefighting and built uh, primarily for the potential of an earthquake. So we have, besides the domestic water system, we have the high pressure system and we also have cisterns in our streets every, um, I'm, I'm not going to say every few blocks, but a lot of the areas of the city have 75,000 gallon. Like a lake? So they're they're in the street. There's a, a manhole cover over them. Oh, so I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. You can draft out of them. So, oh, really? Uh, yeah. I, so I remember seeing that. We have a pretty good redundant water supply system. And of course, we can we can pump right out of the. Of the Interesting. Bay. Wow, so somebody was actually thinking proactively. That's, a, yeah, that's, that's probably refreshing. from 1908 or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Chief, it was uh, Chief Sullivan that was killed on the day of the 1906 earthquake that had already been planning for that there to happen. Uh, there you go. So, uh, Chief Sullivan. Chief Sullivan and Tony. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right. So now let's go back forward. I, I, I wanted to get, cover that. Uh, <laughs> So you do that thing where you do that studying thing again, and you get promoted to battalion chief. Yeah. Um, now you didn't have to push the battalion chiefs back to captain this time, did you? Did that didn't happen? Um, it it may have happened, but I remember. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you get into the studying part of of life, and uh, it becomes you know, you find a, a core group of people: uh, Dave Franklin, Matt McNaughton, Eddie Gonzalez, Rich Slattery. Where, I mean. I know you you guys know it, but to the outside world, it's like on your days off, you pick a date and you go to somebody's house and you're you're reading off scenarios and you're you're getting prepared and um, you're you're challenging yourself. Uh, and, and that that also, as we can all relate to, when you're doing that, I don't want to uh, forget the fact that you're balancing your life right. You're balancing family and and all the other good stuff. One uh, family for the other family. Exactly, and so you. you I, I think it's um, it's important to find that that balance. Uh, great wife, uh, there's my when I got appointed to battalion chief. I've got four four kids: Gabrielle, Tommy, Marty, and Santino. And my wife Sheila uh, will be married 37 years this year. Wow! Uh, welcome to the I tell Murphy. Welcome to the club. The yeah, I married up club. Good for you. Leave that woman alone, would you? Four kids. <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> Keep them busy. Uh, Beautiful yeah, I, family. And, and the other thing that I uh, decided to do to prepare for it is many of the classes that I took, I did not take in the city. And the reason for that is I wanted to get other perspectives on things. I went back to the National Fire Academy. I've been to the conferences. I took play classes throughout throughout the state. And, and no disrespect to our department. I just wanted to get a different perspective and, and learn things that were happening in, in other places. So, uh yeah, and I, I was fortunate to, to get a battalion chief's job and uh, ended up at uh, battalion three for a short period of time. And then there was a change in a, in the regime at headquarters, and the fire chief asked me to become the director of training, Ooh. which was uh, in 2004. So I became the director of training, and, and the former director of training was the current fire chief. So the reason I say that is that you have to be careful about any new ideas that you bring up about things you want to do differently because it might reflect poorly on whoever was there before you. But uh, training was um, a great place to influence people and get things done. I had met uh, Andy Fredericks in the beginning of 2001 and Andy's uh, meeting Andy and reading his articles about small droplets of water was a, uh, key to when on my first staff meeting as a director of training, I had prepared a white paper and convinced the fire chief to convert all of our nozzles to smoothbore nozzles. 
So all of our, and before that, it was kind of a mishmash of what nozzles were on engine companies, but we kind of did a midnight raid on all of our engines and nice. Uh, smooth, and to this day, here we are almost 20 years later, no turning back, all smooth bore seven eighths inch tips on our, on our, on our lines. Uh, got a lot of rescue training done for our truck companies and pre preparation for, you know, the next earthquake. I sound like Chief Lieb. <laughs> that was short. Uh, uh, yeah, I respect him very much. And I love, I enjoyed listening to him on your show, uh, on your podcast. And uh, training is one of those places where you can really make a difference. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt about it. And it was, uh, you build a good prop <clears throat> around you and you start kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. You saw that uh, that prop that was built that I showed you from the earthquake prop. Uh, yep. Goose's Tavern, uh, that was, you know, out of Treasure Island, which we have a training facility out there. That was our earthquake training uh, site. And so there was a lot of funding after 9-11 uh, for, for the departments. And so we made all of our truck companies light rescue, uh, light rescue caches on it, got rescue systems training for all of our truck companies. And it was a, it was a great place to influence the organization. Can you get a beer in that place? Uh, uh, Manhattan. You can get no, Manhattan. Nice, <laughs> nice. My own no, oh, I, mean, I was just gonna say that you know who can get a beer in there. Tony can get a beer in there. Oh, oh. oh. from it. Far from Chief, it. I wanted to see. So, so that that job that you had, where I was making fun of the the picture, and then you told me that you had two guys that you lost there. That yeah. you were a chief at that time. At, at this time, or is this after or before you went to training? No, it was after uh, I was in training. So um, this was uh, June 2nd of 2011. Uh, we can kind of fast forward here. I was in training and then I came out of training and went, uh, got an assistant chief's role. And on uh, June 2nd of 2011, at about 1045 in the morning, got a report of a, a building fire. And uh, first engine company arrived on scene, Lieutenant Vince Perez. Firefighter paramedic Anthony Valerio and uh, the crew. Uh, light smoke showing from the garage. That was his initial radio report. Light smoke showing from the garage. So light that his first move was to bring a uh, a can into the house to go investigate what was going on. So um, I, th th there's a, a number of things that happened here. I was at a meeting at headquarters and quite a ways away from this, this incident. Uh, but... This incident on Berkeley Way is like on Diamond Heights, which is like right in the center of San Francisco, up on the hill. And it's built into a hillside. So it's a descending hillside home. On the Alpha side or the one side, it's two. In and the on back. the Charlie side or the three side is four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Built into a hillside. And so it already has a recipe for crap to happen. Yeah. So Vince and Tony are in investigating. And, uh, not to like 30 seconds after I arrived on scene, uh, you got the next picture, a, a hostile fire event. Holy shit. Takes yeah. place. And um, those windows begin to fail. And that's on uh, the first level below grade. So that's on subdivision one below grade. And uh, all of the energy that was coming from that floor followed the stairs right out, to, out the front door. And Vince and Tony were caught in the path of, they estimate, you know, 1200 degrees going about 25 miles an hour. And, uh, they both, uh, both succumb to their injuries. Um, there's a uh, Vince on the left and Tony on the right. I Vince was a firefighter on engine one, a fireman on engine one when I was a captain of the truck and Tony and I worked together as paramedics at the department of public health. Wow. Um, so I knew both of these guys uh, and it was a, you know, it's, it's, you can't say it's just part of the job. Um, when, when things like this happen, you have to look at what we can do different or better next time. And the recognition of the building and the building layout. But the thing that kind of was a false sense that kind of drew people in a little bit was the initial assessment, you know, light smoke showing, in to investigate and for for the young officers out there that are watching um every door you open every 
other door you open, every window you open, every time you're investigating, you're allowing fresh air to enter the, the building. And then when you open up that door that entered the downstairs level, it uh, it created a, a, a hostile event that couldn't have been predicted. I mean, we have we have, of course, changed our policies based on downhill constructed homes uh, about we know that we should attack them from that level or from below them if you can. And it, it's become I, I hope that it's been an opportunity that Vincent Tony's life was not lost for us, not learning about how we can do things differently in the future. And it was, you know, like every other insult that we suffer in the fire service, you, you can take it as that's just the business that we're in, or you can say, what can we do differently? And I think our department stepped up and did a pretty good investigation into it. That's the key uh, is if you get a good investigation yeah. and you kind of have some reports that say, what, what, could we have done here, you know, not to point the finger or Monday morning quarterback, right? right. But to say, hey, listen, this is what we could. Listen, as soon as you tell me it's four in the back and two in the front, I already know, right? Yeah. You already know. We've had so many of those in, in New York, yeah. you know, where it's just a duplex or or three in the back. We have the Canossi house. Any one of these types of buildings, it goes bad fast when it goes bad, too, you know? Yeah, and it was like I, I, I got out of the buggy and I'm walking down the street. Still had pretty light, wispy smoke trying to figure out the lay. When I came up around the back, I didn't notice anything unusual. Um, another thing, um, and I'm not going to say it contributed to it, but it's something that we learned about it, is the radio. The radios, uh, we're having trouble transmit, uh, communicating with Vince about what was going on. And we found out that an exposed radio cord of a, your normal handy talkie radio at 160 degrees. Oh, so my God. I, Starts to act weird. Open mic, can't transmit. And Vince's left hand was burned. His radio was in his left pocket. He was having trouble with his radio. And it's a, it's acknowledged by the industry that microphone cords, if you're going to wear them, and I'm I tell all the kids now, I don't give a shit what they're going to call you. Get a harness, wear it under your coat. Because if you can protect that radio cord under your coat, you're not going to have this problem. But what's happening is they're going on a medical call, so they're carrying the radio in their in their pants, right? So it's a, wear a harness. That way, if it's in a harness, when you put your coat on, it's protected. Protect the radio cord because 160 degrees, they will acknowledge that you start to get some deterioration of transmission and receiving. And, of course, as the temperature goes up, it gets worse. So we learned a lot. Uh, the companies, the major companies know it's a problem. So, yeah. That's the bad. What year was that? 2011? 2011. 2011. Which, you know, it was a, once again, a kind of lot of really interesting things going on in the department and, and personally, but right after that fire, uh, the fire chief called me up and she asked me if I wanted to become the deputy chief of operations. And um which oversees, you know, both divisions and all the on, all, you know, you're working at headquarters and all the fun stuff that goes with it. And I, I'm not going to say that it was in a time of, uh, you know, thinking I'll just do my time, get a bump in the pension and, and be on my way. Uh, but I, I was a square peg in a round hole. I, it just, it was not going to work. There was a lot going on. There was a mayor's election going on. We had Occupy SF going on. You had Occupy Wall Street going on. There's a lot of crazy shit that was going on in the city. And um, I'll just say the way it ended, if you're not going to trust me, then I'm not a good fit for being in that role. And so I made an unusual uh, move. Um, instead of retiring, I said, I'm not going to go out like this. So I ended up going back to my spot as a division chief. Well, that sounds vaguely familiar to what's going on today, doesn't it? Mm. 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 Uh, I, I think the important part for me on a personal mm -hmm. and professional <clears throat> level is uh, you have to be true to yourself about what's going to take care of you and your family and might be the best for the organization. But secondary to the organization, I, I wasn't about to just step away from the job because I wouldn't have had the opportunity to give back um, 
but I still felt I had a, a lot to give back. So I ended up dem demoting myself back to division chief. And that's where I did the next six years. Wow. And what should you went back to the same division? Back, chief? Yeah. back to division three, back to station seven. Yeah. And that's where you retired out of chief. Yeah. I retired out of uh, division three in June of 2018. Guns, do we have any more pictures from we the chat? Yeah, that was the oh, one. Oh, <laughs> that one. <laughs> Look at the cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a, there's something to be said. Uh, I wish I could blow that up. <laughs> I wish, I bet you do. <laughs> Panama red. Yeah. Panama red. <laughs> but uh, well, a couple of things when working as a division chief, and I know I, I shared with you, it's kind of an interesting. Uh, Saturday afternoon, sitting in the firehouse, all the other companies were out. It was just my aide, uh, Carol, and I. And uh, the the we call it the main line. The phone rings from dispatch, and I answer the phone. And uh, they said, "Hey, Chief, uh, we're going to be sending you down to the airport. There was a hard landing down at SFO." I said, "A hard landing?" I said, "Yeah, we got a phone call. There's a hard landing." Uh, so we cover the airport. We have. Uh, Three stations down at the airport, no chief down there, three engine companies. So I said, you know, we go through this every once in a while, but never anything serious, right, until I'm working. So Carol and I, we started heading down that way. And the airport division is not talking to our dispatch center. And we come over just past Candlestick Point, and we come over to the rise and I say to Carol, I go, is that smoke that I'm seeing? She goes, I think that's smoke because it's an shit. industrial area and it might have been steam. So I get on the radio. I said, is there a report of a fire? They go, no, there's no fire. There's nothing going on. And never in my wildest dreams would I pull up to a 777 well involved in fire with people still getting off the plane, coming out the slides. Oh, wow. Wow. And people running back to go get their suitcases, <laughs> believe it or not. That's crazy. No, I believe it. Unbelievable. Chief, and what was what was the, the flight again? When you said it, I remembered it. It was a Asiana flight 214. Asiana. That's the one that hit short of the runway, right? Yeah, it hit right at the end of the runway and it and kind of catapulted up in the air. Wow. So right as we're coming on scene, we get a report on the radio that there's still people trapped on the plane. And there was a flight attendant that was standing nearby and she had a piece of paper in her hand and I said, hey, Carol, go over and see if that's the manifest and how many people and blah, blah, blah. So she brings the flight attendant back and she's able to tell us there's 294 passengers, 13 mm -hmm. crew members, and that there are some of her crew members that are still unaccounted for. And I find out from her where they are and so I sent the, the squad and, and the 17 truck up onto the plane. I said, you got to get us another search of that plane. And uh, ended up being three fatalities. Uh, one of them from uh, apparently from getting run over by one of our ARF rigs and a couple of others. That, I heard. I remember that, Chief. Yeah, I yeah. remember so when, that. When you put that foam blanket down when you first get there, and now whoever's on the ground is covered up, one of our engines leaving to go fill up again ended up, in my opinion, I think she was probably already dead, but the coroner said otherwise. But it was a... Uh, it was a lesson in a lot of things. I learned an awful lot that day about politics and finger pointing and, and all that stuff. But bottom line, I couldn't have been prouder of the crews that day of what they did. I mean, I told them to get onto that plane and do another search. And I guys didn't hesitate. Uh, they went up the ramps. The, the tail section was gone. The ramps were still in place and they were able to get up and, uh, and conduct a search uh, of the plane. The plane was still burning, right? I mean, it was, it was still, still going. It was still rolling, yeah. And, you know, I, I get it. There's fuel on there. And um, I had enough I had enough crews there and enough lines in place. I felt comfortable sending them on the, on the plane. And, you know, after the fact, you hear from, you know, FAA and F all these other people. That's not, that's not how things are supposed to go. But that's how it went that day. And I'd do it again. I would do it again. Wow. This guy knows how to go out with a bang. Dude, are you <laughs> kidding me, bro? <laughs> he's got, he's had some, uh, what else do we have? I know we had more pictures there. We do. We have what was that one picture that you had with all the, the, uh, the black guys there, the whole, there was like five of them there. Yeah. That was his, uh, that was the part two of his yeah. retirement. Yeah. That's, uh, my, uh, when I was the captain there, that was a uh, part of my truck company that was there. So they showed up for my last night on the job. 
Which guy was the guy that was leaning over? Is he the guy on the left again or the oh, guy on the, on the left? That's Robert. He is, right? <laughs> he looked familiar. <laughs> nice. Great, great, great guys. Yeah, it was a really good crew. Um, if you have a little bit of, we have a little bit of time. Just one, one, thing, uh, one of the things that I was super proud of in our organization, and I know you have some pictures of it, but I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, oh, we know that California, California burns every summer, right? We have fires uh, all, all over the state of California, but San Francisco wasn't much of a player in sending, sending help for that. Uh, and back in the day, if we did send help, our guys ended up getting in more trouble than they were worth sending anywhere. If you know what I'm saying. So uh, another gentleman uh, ended up retiring as a battalion chief, Ted Corporandi, very good friend of mine that I talked with a lot. Ted, uh, started a, a company called Fire Nuggets. And just, a, I, I respect Ted very much. We we recognize that. Ted worked for the feds and I worked for Cal California Department of Forestry. And we started to improve our training. And uh, over some period of time, and I remember when it happened in 2006, I, I said earlier, we didn't have very much equipment. So I convinced the chief to let me buy five used engines from the state of California. For 50,000 bucks, 10,000 bucks a piece in 2006. <laughs> they Those started? Days lasted us for almost 10 years and traveled from San Diego. Is this one of them? No, that was <laughs> <laughs> That's an early one. <laughs> we didn't show that one before. That's that a no, no, they get to it. <laughs> That's why I figured I'd bring it up. That was in 76 or 77. That's a yeah. great picture. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's like a Cheech and Chong's movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> License and registration. Is it that on the back of the car, man? <laughs> but with those five engines, with the training and kind of planting the seed for we, we traveled to the state of California from San Diego to the Oregon border to Nevada. And we're, we were involved in a lot of the significant events, uh, especially the last several years. One that happened right in my, my own backyard. I live in Petaluma, which is in Sonoma County, about 35 minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And Sonoma County had our uh, you know, once in a lifetime fire, the Tubbs fire back in 2017. And uh, I was at home that night, was able to get into the city, get a crew together and, and up here into Sonoma County. That was on a Sunday night. And we were assigned to... Um, Glen Ellen, which is a small town in Sonoma County. And, and believe it or not, we're the first crews to show up there and we're knocking on doors, getting people out of their house while propane tanks are blowing up all around us. But uh, the crew that I had, and you have that picture, the one that I had, uh, those are the, the guys that were um, from various departments that were recognized by Sonoma County for what happened the night of the Tubbs fire. And uh, if there was one area of my career that I am the most proud of is what we were able to do for our, our, our mutual aid response and our wildland preparation. And I, I sold it to our administration, to our chief by saying, we know we're going to have our event. You know, 1906 is going to happen again. We're going to be asking for help. So why not do it now? And we have enough folks to be able to get it, get it done. And uh, very proud of that very proud of that group. There's an, another picture, Gonzo, of there was four of us that were on that Tubbs fire. We're all Dagos. And so we called it the uh, 70 day, 71 engine was uh, Marcoletti, Bonetti, Saragusa, and Paganini. <laughs> Me. Yeah. Sure wasn't it wasn't Where's the cannolis? Yeah. Where's it? Well, his name was Tony, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the one they, they, charge the him, they charge him 10,000 bucks. It's a green yeah, that's rig, bro. That was one of those engines we paid ten grand for. Yeah, yeah. the wonder it's a yellow ring. Like, ah, I'm yeah, I know. Shit. Yeah. I oh, know. Man, it started. I know. That's <laughs> and it that held one. Uh, Gods, could you please? Ken Smith wants to ask him about the uh, the Rico story. Oh, uh, let me go. Which one? <laughs> What's his name? Look at uh, the somebody chief. else paid up for him. The chief. Uh, asked oh, okay. There we go. Stuff. Sorry, uh, I was. Who's, who's, who's Rico? Attention. Here we go. I have one other one. Uh, I'll just give you one Dorico story. Ken Smith wants so, to hear the – how you say it? Dorico? Dorico. So Tony Dorico was a firefighter, fireman at, at Seven Truck. So when I was a captain of Seven Truck, he was one of the firemen. And, and I, I'll give you 
there's several stories. The first story <laughs> was when he was on probation at 38 Engine. The telephone, the outside telephone rings, and I'm watching the news or reading the paper, and I hear him talking on the phone, and he says, uh, "Hey, Captain, I think it's for you." So I go over and I answer the phone, and it's my wife. She goes, "Who was that?" I go, "Why?" She goes, "Well, I was, I asked for you. He didn't know who you were." And then he says to my wife, "Oh, you mean the old bald dude?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that guy. So I go, "I'll call you back." Come here. <laughs> uh, that's one Dorico story. But uh, the other Dorico story was he he had an interesting way about him. And he convinced everybody when he came on the job that he had been in prison before. And everybody kind of believed him because of how he looked. So in a very early time in his career, he was he was somewhat respected because they thought he was really in prison. But he was never in prison. I, I've got a few other stories about him, but. Yeah, I'm not going to do that today. Right. <laughs> Thanks, well, yeah, Ken. I got one more of the guys uh, from a little bit before. He paid a few shekels, so we'll uh, we'll bring it on up for you. He says, "Can you okay. ask him about the San Francisco Fire Reserves from Mr. Dustin Thomas?" So oh, uh, the San, the San Francisco Fire Reserves uh, are city residents that are interested in the in maybe getting into the fire service or just being a part of the community, and uh, they meet every Thursday night and they go through a bunch of training. They show up at uh, Greater Alarm Fires to help with picking up hose and doing any other tasks that uh, are needed. Um, it's a great uh, it's a great group. They've been around for a, a long time, and from the community involvement perspective, whether you want to be a firefighter or not, there's a connection to the fire department, and I think it's some of them are buff, some of them want to get onto the job, but they always come willing to work and do something for us so yeah the reserves are a great group it was cool. like the old new york city fire patrol yeah. yeah all right chief we gotta ask you so uh we got a few minutes before uh we're gonna get to the old school tip give me uh give me your take on the uh vertical ventilation <laughs> <sighs> deep breath so uh how do you guys do it so we peak, go peak roof peak roof Peak roof, we're growing ground ladders, uh, getting a crew up on the roof, coordinating with in interior and, and getting that thing opened up. Um, ridge ladder, roof ladder, ridge ladder, whatever is necessary. Uh, top venting. Uh, if, if we get a, a flat roof, uh, single family, couple, couple uh, firefighters going to the roof, uh, get in the rear, check the rear for any fire, pick the right spot, coordinate with the crews on the interior. Give me a four by four hole, open up. Uh, if we get a SRO, six story, ordinary constructed place, uh, first truck company, we throw the fire escape ladder, uh, driver gets the aerial to the roof, guys that are on the fire escape, they take the fire escape up to the roof, checking the floors on the way up. The tiller might join them up on the roof if it's a top floor fire. And of course, when you get to the roof, check the sides, rear, light well, get that bulkhead door, check it for for any victims. And then if it is a top floor fire, we're, we're cutting a hole on the, on the top floor and opening up. What we're not going to do is put any fan into operation until, <laughs> until three days from now when we want to clear it out. Of, <laughs> uh, it ain't going to happen. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you remember the story of what happened in just across the bay from us in Contra Costa County, a contributing factor in that fire was, the standard operating procedure at the time was the first company stretched the line to go in and put the fire out. The second company showed up, fired up the fan, and uh, fire was up in a concealed space. The, the crew inside had dropped their line because they thought they had it knocked. But when they fired up the fan, it, it lit things up. He, he, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how that became part of an initial attack criteria, but it was never going to happen in, on our job. Uh, for a lot of different reasons. You need to know where the fire is. You need to know where you're pushing all that energy to. Um, and if, you, if you're trained well, you don't need a fan blowing at your back to be able to go ahead and, and, and find the location of the fire. So we are big into vertical ventilation. Uh, horizontal ventilation, I have, 
I remember going and listening to Bobby Pressler talk one time about, you know, he loved taking every effing window in the place out and, and, and opening things up. <clears throat> and I don't want to say that things have evolved, but what's burning today in the year 2023, uh, the energy, the heat release rate, uh, the products that are burning, we're going to have a, a more hostile event take place when you start taking out windows. And I mean, you saw what happened on that fire up on Berkeley Way. One window failed in the back. That was a room and contents fire. That was a large room, never got into the structure at all. But the amount of energy that was being released because of one, one window fail, failing was, was incredible. So I'm all for top floor fire, open up, vertically vent, get coordinate with the crews inside. Uh, anything lower than that, work your way down and, and open up windows. Mm -hmm. Well, like we say, like I say all the time on, on vertical vent, I don't, I don't have a problem with what exact anything that you just said. What, what I have a problem with is when it's a one and a half story building and there's 16 guys on the roof and there's not a window taken in the whole place. And right. I don't even know if there's a line in the building, but everybody's on the roof because they don't have to go in the building. Right. That's the way it seems to me anyway. Yeah. I think one of the mistakes and uh, there was a lot of dialogue about this and I, I don't want to cast shade on how things were done in the past. And I'm not going to say that it was a mistake, but I think one thing that you need to, we needed to learn from is when you put two truck companies on a roof, all you're asking for is a roof that looks like Swiss cheese. And you're, yeah, chasing, right. fire what you the, you're chasing fire in that attic space because every hole you're opening up, you're saying to the fire, Hey, come here, fire. Instead exactly. of making a hole, yep. Make it bigger and controlling the ventilation. Plus, when Make we do bigger. when we do the flat roof, right? We we always took the skylight. You take the bulkhead, right? That's that's kind of doing what you do on a peak roof, right? But that's an open stairway, so you're relieving the fire conditions for for the guys or and for and for and for the people in there, right? When you cut a roof on a peak roof, if you have a a wood floor in an attic, you know, which most of the ones, the, the, almost every peak roof I've ever been in, they have a wood floor. If nobody's in the attic, I mean, unless somebody's living in the attic, but for the most part, I mean, most of the ones we went to, nobody was even in there. So you weren't even really venting anything initially. That that was always my take is nobody's taking any glass. And I'm not talking about running around taking glass, just yeah, yeah, willy-nilly. Yeah. I'm talking about get in there, get the line in there, start taking glass as you move, start venting, you know, listen, guys have gone, and I'm sure every guy here would say, we, we listen, we hopped up into an attic when it was on fire, passed the line up, took a beating, but you put the line out. And, right, right, right. you know, so that's the only issue that I have is I yeah. see six guys cutting holes. And, you know, whether it's a two and a half story thing or, you know, obviously, you know, for you, if you if, if you got to, you know, you're putting up these ladders for three, four story buildings that have peak roofs. That's one thing I can understand if you're making an attack. But we've had countless pictures where there's a three story building. There's not a window taken in the whole place. Right, right. And I see six guys, mm. this fire vent through the roof and there ain't nobody doing anything. You know, again, you can't tell much from a picture. That's, that's the only thing, you know, exactly. No. And the other thing where you learn, we would get um, top floor fire gets into the attic space. Right. So what used to drive me crazy is you get guys, you're pulling ceilings. You got a line that's operating like straight up like this. Get a fucking ladder up into that attic space. Get the line up in the attic space and put the fire out. Yeah, yeah, right. If you're operating from down here. You're putting out three or four square feet of fire. Right, right, right. Get up in that attic space. Yeah, you got to scooch. Somebody's got to get up there and uh, there. take a beating. Yeah, there ain't no good way. Yeah, you just got to get up there, bro. Yeah, <laughs> but thank you for the uh, uh, listen, uh, Chief. I just like breaking balls to the guys anyway. But for the most part, as Louis long as Pet as long as they're Pet being aggressive, <laughs> that's it. It don't matter. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else that you had, Chief? Anything else? Any stories you want to touch on? Look, I wrote down some notes here. I don't want to miss up on. Uh... Do I it. Got one. I got one for you if you want to touch on it. Go ahead. We got this picture. Oh, right we here. didn't touch on this oh. picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, uh, That was in 1981. Uh, I'm working in San Rafael on the, the medic unit. So it's Steve Takamoto and I, and it's three or four blocks away from the firehouse. So engine 51 pulled up in front. And fire's coming out the front door. And you can't really see it in this picture, but there's fire in the eaves up above. This woman is standing outside that you see standing next to me. And she says, my baby's inside. And 
I believe her, her baby's inside, but the engines can't, is having trouble making the front door. So Steve and I throw a ladder to the balcony and go in through that window. And when we come back out, Steve found the baby in a crib, a, a week and a half old baby in a crib. Oh my God. Wow. She'd gone to the store and left some food on the stove. But when we come out, she's now standing. She followed us right up the ladder. <laughs> so, uh, All right. Give her credit for that. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> I'm handing the baby off to Steve on the ladder. I help her get on the ladder and come off. About three minutes after this picture is taken, you can kind of see it at the top there. There's that drop line going into the building. It came yeah. down and it energized the balcony that I was standing on. Knocked me out i was oh gotcha really baby. shocking out. yes oh, i have a little mark on my nope. do you really yeah wow so um yeah so a week and a half and so and i i have vowed to do this i haven't done it yet so how many years ago is that 42 years ago i'd like to follow up and find out where this kid is at you know i'm gonna have to do some re i got the name i got the the article in the newspaper i haven't done it it just hey, it's 42 you know, years old now that would be pretty cool. Can imagine wow. that. Yeah. That would yeah. be pretty cool. You know what's even cooler? What was it? Steve's last name? Takamoto. Holy shit. You had a Japanese guy working there? What the <laughs> hell? <laughs> All these guineas. Now he breaks out of Yakamoto. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, no less. Hey, what's your name? Steve. I made the grab. Yakamoto. <laughs> Got the grab. Uh, good for him. Yeah, oh, yeah, right, man. You know, Ruffy, we found the guy. We got our West no, Coast I knew. guy. I now. said it. I said and it. Ruffy did say, he said, Coops, I, think this I got the guy. Deal. I got the guy. This <laughs> day, Tony, 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 thanks for coming on, Tony. Tony you, great job. Great job, Tony. Tony. <laughs> I'm glad you won the Super Bowl in '86 or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> there, there, he is. there he is. Lost there a little is. weight. <laughs> oh, you lost some weight since then. Oh, Tony, I think Tony, the chief was saying, I think Tony, uh, he bit the dust not too long ago. Yeah, he ago. passed away last year or two years oh, ago. Oh, did he? He was yeah. only 55. Oh, well, we're glad oh. you're not Tony. We're glad you're Tom. Yeah, yeah, we are glad. And this is Tom. Tom's time. Gonzo. So is it Tom's ready, time? Oh, is, I'm ready if you're ready. Oh, you ready? Yeah, let's it. go. Let's do it. It's time for the old, the old school, school tip of, of the, the day. 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 Go ahead, Chief. Take it away. Pay attention. If you're just coming on the job or you've been on the job for any amount of time, Pay attention to the little things. When you're new and the chief comes into the station to talk to your boss, listen to what they're talking about. When you go to a job and you come outside, pay attention to where all the hose lines went, where all the ladders went, who made the supply. Pay attention to what's happening in the country, what's happening on jobs everywhere. What can we learn by paying attention? So I, I think what goes with that in my old school tip of the day is to get off of your effing phone when you're at the firehouse and pay attention. Talk to people, listen to stories, and good things will happen. Amen. Amen. Talk like it, it up. I was always Talk my favorite up. thing to get do. Off the phone. Get off, get off the phone. Get off the phone. I like it's, it. We can, do a, we can do a whole story. You can do. A whole oh my story. God, we could do a whole. And I but, only caught the, the tail end of that. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, like the guys were. Uh, I would come down to, for roll call. I, I've told the story many, many times on the show. But I would come down, and they would all be sitting around, like waiting for me to come down at nine o'clock. I would get there early, like whatever, ten to, and I would sit there, and they wouldn't even sometimes know that I was sitting there, and they would just. You know, yeah. like everybody does, like we do. I do it. Into their, into their, so, and sure as shit, the beep boop would go off at nine o'clock, and they would still. So I'd be like, uh, and my daughter's name is Sabrina. So I'd be like, Sabrina, put the phone <laughs> away, you know. And they'd be like, Oh, sorry, Lou, you know, sorry. I'm like, That's all right, don't worry yeah. about it. But the, I have to say, the guys mm -hmm. were, the guys were really good. Like where where I worked, it was like Disney World. It really, it really was. I'm sure in places that might not have the guys who are. Uh, 1000 percent into the it, believing into the program then maybe that might be the case but i have to say my guys uh really were the best but but i, I mean it, the other the part of the the paying attention it, it is those little things you know looking in the journal listening to what the chief's talking to the boss about mm. looking at the hose leads that were i mean just just pay attention I, that was a great little tip too that you said that because i remember 
when the chief came, I always wanted to know what was kind of going on. You know what I mean? If he was going to come up and have coffee, you know, we I would make the coffee or whatever, and then I would hang around and see what they were talking about. You know, what was going on in the town? You just got to yeah, listen. just listen. Just listen to what's going on. Hey, hey, Rook, would, would you include that you were proud of you guys even the time that I backed into the Chinese guy's car? We, <laughs> not so much that day. You what the doing? fuck are you doing? Right in the window. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> It was a job, too. We had a job. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, well, Tom, Chief, appreciate it. Had a great time. Thank you very much. You, you yes. saved you saved the single-handedly the reputation of the West Coast. He yeah. did it. That's what it takes. Is it like, don't you like gang signs on West Coast? Is that Even if, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. What do we got? I don't know what's that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. So I only got, uh, anybody else have a shout out? Anybody? Um, I actually have a little. I was reminded that it's telecommunicators week for our dispatchers. I don't know if you want to get a little shout out to them for all the good things that they do for us. But uh, somebody brought that what? to my attention. Telecommunicators, our dispatchers. Yeah, it's right, telecommunicator week. Oh, is, is it? it? Yeah, I didn't know that. So, oh, look yeah. at you, you buff. Go ahead, throw it out buff. there. No, that's that's what it is. I just give a big thanks so, to them for what they do. You know, those guys. All those guys. True you know, first responders, buffs, man. Beef. I saw, that, I saw that picture you Beef. in that towel ladder. Who yeah. me? No. Dave Coop. Toes, we did the oh, bells last week uh, well, for the Chicago guys. Come on, catch up, buddy. Uh, I have a shout-out. We have Harrisburg coming up uh, May 18th, 19th, and 20th. So come out and see the Salty Gang down in Harrisburg, PA, at the show. Actually, been getting, the last few shows have been getting better there, actually. Right. Since COVID. So yes. I'm sure it's going to be packed out this year. All right, God's Apotamus. Why don't we you have take to do our, uh, pay our bills, and then we can uh, do our outro. I mean, our outro, and then we can get out of Dodge. All right, do the outro. Here we go. Well, thank you, first and foremost, for tuning in to another episode of the Getting Salty Experience. Think we're out of good content? Ha! Far from it. If you want to find us on the audio side, you can do so on all the players. We're available on, yes, I said that correctly, all the players. Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts, that's where we are. And if you're here tonight, congratulations. You found us on the Getting Salty Experience, which if you're not already subscribed, please do so. It's free, cost you nothing. You can also like and share, which also cost you nothing and helps us grow the audience of the show. You can also find us on social media if you so please. Of course, we're on Instagram where Lou posts great FDNY content from yesteryear. We're also on TikTok. Tangum is Prime is on top of that. And we're also on LinkedIn too, where yours truly, Mike McBob Cologne, is on top of things on that front. Head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com, by the way, for all kinds of great merchandise, apparel, and accessories. There is a super chat, too. We thank each and every one of you for your support. You can open up your wallet and donate a amount of your choosing during the program. After all, you guys, yes, you guys are our number one sponsors. Super thanks as well. If you missed the show live, you can show support through that means if you still wish to open up your wallet. The super thanks is basically a thank you after the fact for another great episode of ours. The Facebook fan page is in existence too, now over 60,000 strong and continuing to grow. It's not created by us at the Getting Salty Experience, but it is nevertheless a great way to connect with firefighters from all over and fans of the show alike. If you want to advertise with the Getting Salty Experience, send your information on over to gettingsaltyads at gmail.com. And if you have any questions or have a guest suggestion, please send them to gettingsaltyexperience at gmail.com with the necessary contact information. And finally, if you have content for anything else, please send them to coobspodcast at gmail.com. Of course, that's Kevin Kubler's secondary email. And that's where you could send things like rig photos, firehouse kitchen tables, fire videos, helmet cam videos, tattoos, mustache photos, and yes, photos for the unofficial Hot Old Ladies contest that we may or may not be holding, allegedly. Thanks once again for tuning in to the Getting Salty Experience. He's a true professional, that McBob. He's such a, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, he is a true professional. All right, so Thursday night, of course, we have the final fail, final episode. Oh with, my uh, god, Mike Barone. <laughs> Barone. Are we sure it's a final week? I, I don't even know if I, we're in the I, 80s I, yet. We're not even, we're not in, even the in the 80s, 80s yet, for crying out loud. But if you like a lot of umgats, come on over on Thursdays for all you umgats. He loves well, the umgats. No, he's, we, a, he's a lot of fun, 80 something years old. God bless him. Yeah. That's it. He's got, That's it. It's got a better memory than me and Coop's put together. I know. I, I told you. I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. This guy's telling me about boxes he went on 40 oh years ago. Oh, my God. Incredible. <laughs> Press that one. All uh, right, fellas. Again, Chief, Tom, Tony, Saragosa, thank you for coming on. Chief, Thanks great for... job. It was a pleasure. You, really, Chief. our honor. Yes. It was. Yes. 
appreciate it. Thanks, Chief. And uh, Gon's great job tonight, bro. Smooth. Yeah, well yeah, done. Yeah, Coops didn't touch any buttons. See that? No, I didn't have to yell at anybody. I didn't do nothing. Nope. Meanwhile, Coops was taking, uh, you know, he was sliding <laughs> under the radar that whole time. You sneaky bastard. Oh, joy. Another attack. Oh, there he is right now. What is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks, Patty yeah. Lee. Louis, Louis, appreciate that. Patty Lee, get me Max, uh, Frankie Max number. I'll call him. Yes. And while you're at it, I'll go home and get your fucking shine box. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys on Thursday night. Until then, stay low and go. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Thanks again, Chief. All right, guys. Everyone be safe. <laughs>